I am going to start with the first lesson, Historical Foundations of Psychology, Nature and Goals of Psychology. Well, the objectives of the lesson are to understand the definition and nature of psychology, talk about the historical foundations of psychology and when we talk about the history, we will be mentioning about structuralism, functionalism, gestalt psychology and several contemporary perspectives in psychology like the neuroscience perspective, the psychodynamic perspective, the behavioral perspective, cognitive perspective, humanistic perspective and the socio-cultural perspective. And we will end the lesson with the goals of psychology. So, let us talk about what is psychology and nature of psychology. Many people tell you many things about psychology. Psychology people say that you read the mind of people, that you can understand what is going on in the people. Well, let me tell you, psychology is the scientific study of behavior and the mental processes including their biological activities, feelings, perceptions, memory, reasoning and thoughts. Application of psychology is vast. Psychologists try to describe, predict as well as explain human behavior as well as mental processes and also help to change and improve the lives of people and the world in which they live. Psychologists use scientific methods to find answers. The word psychology comes from the Greek words psyche meaning life and logos meaning explanation. Psychologists study behavior at different levels of explanation, ranging from the lower biological levels to the higher social as well as cultural levels. And in the process, they employ scientific method. And this method allows psychologists to objectively as well as systematically understand human behavior. Psychology touches on many aspects of our lives. Some of the basic questions asked by psychologists both historically as well as even currently till today include those about relative roles of nature versus nurture in behavior, free will versus determinism, accuracy versus inaccuracy and conscious versus unconscious processing. Psychologists work in several areas. They work in research laboratories, hospitals and other field settings where they study the behavior of humans as well as animals. Research and practice are both seen in the field of psychology. They are like two eyes of psychology and the scientific methods are used by psychologists to inform their work. This is why it is called a science. Now, let us move to the historical foundations of psychology. Knowledge of the history of psychology illustrates its theoretical developments, its uniqueness among sciences, the evolution of its methods used by psychology and its varied roles in the life of an individual as well as society. Let us start with ancient Greeks. Ancient Greeks have considered the mind a suitable topic for scholarly contemplation. Ancient Greek philosopher Socrates about 2500 years ago proposed the concept of know thyself. Socrates suggested that we should rely on rational thought as well as introspection. What is introspection? It is a careful examination of one's own thoughts and emotions to gain self-knowledge awareness. He also pointed out that people are social creatures who influence one another. Another Greek philosopher Aristotle way back 384 to 322 BC argued that human behavior like the movements of the stars and the seas also is subject to rules and laws. So, just as astronomical objects, even human behavior is subject to laws. Then he delved into his subject matter that is personality, sensation and perception, thought, intelligence, needs and motives, feelings and emotions and memory. 
around 400 BC, Democritus suggested that we could think of behavior in terms of a body and mind. Now you see the difference from mind over to body and mind. Then in 17th century, British philosopher John Locke believed that children were born into this world with minds like blank slates. It is called tabula rasa in Latin and that their experiences determined what kind of adults they would become. His views contrasted with those of Plato and the 17th century French philosophers like René Descartes who actually argued way back that some knowledge was inborn in humans but remember Locke said they are clean slates. The development of psychology as a laboratory science was seen during the second half of 19th century. Some historians set the marker date as 1860, some of them, when Gustav Theodor Fechner, who belonged to 1801 to 1887, published his landmark book called Elements of Psychophysics, which showed how physical events such as lights and sounds are related to psychological sensation and perception. However, the formal beginning of psychology as a scientific discipline is generally considered to be in the late 19th century when in Leipzig in Germany, Wilhelm Wundt established the first experimental laboratory. This was devoted to psychological phenomena. At about the same time, we should also note that William James was setting up his laboratory in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So from here, let us move on to one of the first and foremost schools well known, which is structuralism. When Wundt set up his laboratory, his aim was to study the building blocks of the mind. He considered psychology to be the study of conscious experience. His perspective, which came to be known as structuralism, focused on uncovering the fundamental mental components of perception, consciousness, thinking, emotions and other kinds of mental states and activities. So, moving on, structuralism now attempted to break conscious experience down into objective sensations such as sight or taste and subjective feelings such as emotional responses and mental images such as memories or dreams. Structuralists believed that the mind functions by combining objective as well as subjective elements of experience. So thus we move from the description of one of the first and foremost well uh, explained schools which is structuralism which talked about the structure of human behavior or human psychology over to the next concept that is next theory which is functionalism. Now in functionalism rather than focusing on the mind's structure, functionalism concentrated on what the mind does, the function of the mind and how behavior functions. Towards the end of the 19th century, psychologist William James, he belonged to the period 1842 to 1910, he focused on the relation between conscious experience and behavior. Under his leadership led by him, the functionalists examined how behavior enables people to satisfy their needs and how our stream of consciousness thinking permits us to adapt to our environment. They also turned to the laboratory for direct observation as a way to supplement introspection mentioned by structuralists. Functionalists asked what role behavior plays in helping people adapt to their environment. The American educator John Dewey drew on functionalism to develop the field of school psychology. 
Now let us move on to another school called Gestalt Psychology. So another important reaction thus to structuralism was the development of Gestalt Psychology. This Gestalt Psychology was notable in 1930s and three founders were very famous. One was Max Wertheimer, Kurt Kafka and Wolfgang Kohler. Gestalt Psychology emphasizes how perception is organized. The German word Gestalt translates roughly to pattern or organized whole. Instead of considering the individual parts which make up thinking, Gestalt psychologists took the opposite track, studying how people consider individual elements together as units or wholes. In contrast to behaviorists, Gestalt psychologists argued that we cannot hope to understand human nature by focusing only on overt behavior. On the other hand, in contrast to structuralists, they claimed that we cannot explain human perceptions, emotions or thought processes in terms of basic units. Perceptions are more than sums of their parts. Gestalt psychologists saw our perceptions as wholes, the holistic totality that is what it means. So moving on, these wholes give meaning to parts and not separately and propose that the whole is different from the sum of its parts. This means our perception of objects is greater and more meaningful than the individual elements that make up our perceptions. They demonstrated that much learning, especially in problem solving, is accomplished by insight and not by mechanical repetition. Here they are criticizing the behaviorism. So now let us move on to contemporary perspectives in psychology. So today, there are several broad influential perspectives in psychology. They may be biological, cognitive, humanistic, existential, psychodynamic, learning approach and socio-cultural approaches. Let us start with something which is related to the biological, the neuroscience perspective. The neuroscience perspective considers how people and non-humans as well function biologically, how the individual nerve cells are joined together, how the inheritance of certain characteristics influences the behavior of an individual, how the functioning of the body affects hopes and fears, which behaviors are instinctual, which are not and so many other factors. Even more complex kinds of behavioral patterns such as a baby's response to strangers, such responses are also viewed as having critical biological components by psychologists who embrace this neuroscience perspective. Now let us move on to a psychodynamic perspectives. Proponents of psychodynamic perspective argue that behavior is motivated by inner forces as well as conflicts about which we have little awareness or control. The unconscious zone is emphasized. They view dreams and slips of the tongue as indications of what a person is truly feeling within a seething cauldron of this unconscious psychic activity. Let us now move on to the next most influential perspective which is behavioral perspective. This behavioral perspective grew out of a rejection of psychology's early emphasis upon the inner workings of the mind and of course the Freud's unconscious. John Rodas Watson, he belonged to the period between 1878 to 1958. He was the first major psychologist to advocate behavioral perspective and the behavioral approach. So Watson believed that if psychology was to be a natural science like physics or chemistry, 
then it must limit itself to the observable, measurable and something which can be replicable as well events that is the behavior alone to behavior alone. Hence, they have used the term behaviorism. Watson emphasized that one could gain a complete understanding of behavior by studying and modifying the environment in which people operate. An important contribution we should mention over here was made by Pavlov whose physiology experiments with dog have paved way to a classic proposition called classical conditioning. This was the basis in fact and these findings encouraged influential behaviorists thus. So, moving on B. F. Skinner who belonged to the period 1904 to 1990 was one more prominent theorist who made major contributions to this school of behaviorism and he believed that organisms learn to behave in certain ways because they have been reinforced for doing so that is they are rewarded for doing so. Their behavior has a positive outcome reinforcement means being rewarded and getting a positive outcome. He demonstrated that laboratory animals can be trained to carry out behaviors through strategic use of these reinforcers such as food. His theory and principles were referred to as operant conditioning that is the organism operates upon the environment in order to get the reinforcement and reinforcement improves the behavior of the organism. Many contemporary psychologists study the effects of experience on behavior. Learning according to them is the essential factor in describing, explaining, predicting and controlling behavior. Like Watson, contemporary behaviorists today emphasize environmental influences and the learning of habits through repetition and reinforcement as well. Social cognitive theorists in contrast suggest that people can modify and create their environments. They also grant cognition a key role, cognition higher order mental processes. They note that people engage in intentional learning by observing others. We now move on to this important perspective that is cognitive perspective evolving in part from structuralism and in part as a reaction to behaviorism which focused so heavily on observable behavior and environment, the cognitive perspective focuses on how people think, understand and know about the world. Its emphasis is on learning how people comprehend and represent the outside world within themselves and how our ways of thinking about the world influence our behavior. Psychologists with a cognitive perspective investigate the ways we perceive and mentally represent the world, how we learn, how we remember the past, plan for the future, solve the problems, form judgments, make decisions as well as use language. So from here let us move on to the humanistic perspective. Rejecting the view that behavior is determined largely by automatically unfolding biological forces unconscious processes psychoanalysis or the environment as behaviorists say the humanistic perspective instead suggests that all individuals naturally strive to grow develop and be in control of their lives and behavior. Humanistic psychologists maintain that each of us has the capacity to seek and reach fulfillment of our ultimate potential. According to Carl Rogers and Abraham Maslow who were central figures in the development of the humanistic perspective, people will strive to reach their full potential when given the opportunity. The emphasis of the humanistic perspective is free will, the ability to freely make decisions about one's own behavior and life. The notion of free will stands in contrast to the determinism which sees behavior as caused or determined by things beyond a person's control like what uh, psychoanalysts and behaviorists say. The humanistic perspective on the other hand assumes that people are able to make their own choices about their behavior rather than relying on societal standards. Thus we move on to the last perspective 
in today's discussion, the socio-cultural perspective. Many psychologists believe we cannot understand people's behavior and mental processes without reference to their diversity. The socio-cultural perspective addresses many of the ways that people differ from one another. It studies the influences of ethnicity, gender, culture and socio-economic status on the behavior of an individual as well as the mental processes. Later developments in 20th century psychology included information processing theory, psycholinguistics and neuropsychology. Psychologists no longer describe themselves as structuralists or functionalists. Although the school of gestalt psychology gave birth to a lot of research and current research approaches in perception and problem solving, few would now label themselves as only gestalt psychologists. The numbers of orthodox behaviorists and psychoanalysts have been declining and many contemporary psychologists in the behaviorist tradition for that matter look at themselves more as social cognitive theorists who see much of the human learning as intentional rather than mechanical. Now let us move to the goals of psychology. Four goals of psychology are mentioned over here. One is identifying and classifying the behaviors and mental processes as accurately as possible. Psychology also proposes reasons for behavioral processes and mental processes. Psychology offers predictions or if we have to use the technical term hypothesis about how a given condition or set of conditions will affect behaviors and mental processes using the result of research to solve practical problems that involve behavior as well as mental processes. So thus we are going to conclude today's discussion. In our session we have talked about the what is psychology, the nature of psychology and we discussed in detail the historical foundations of psychology. We started with structuralism, we moved on to functionalism, we also talked about gestalt psychology and in detail we have discussed about the contemporary perspectives in psychology like the neuroscience perspective. We moved on from psychoanalysis to the psychodynamic perspectives and the perspectives of several followers or people who have digressed from Freud and we also talked about the behavioral perspective and cognitive behavioral perspective in the process and we also talked about social behaviorism as well and we moved on to cognitive perspective and humanistic perspective and we concluded the perspectives in psychology with socio-cultural perspectives and we briefly talked about the goals of psychology as well. 